people probably don't know, the town of Moulton Grove was chartered 250 years ago this year. So this evening's presenter is my husband, Bruce Gary, and he's going to talk about the chartering and the incorporation and explain the difference. So I would like everyone <coughs> to welcome Mr. Gary. <laughs> I know what it's like to be roped. <laughs> Came from close to home, didn't it? Very. I said I'd be a backup. I don't know how hard they look, but... Um, I have to start by saying this is uh, kind of a little special to me, the dedicated to uh, Bill Pew. The reason why I even have all of this is about a dozen years ago, we tried to get a movement going to do the history of the town of Moultonboro. And uh, the only ones that really, because uh, we're a little bit off, is me and Jane don't mind taking extended days and living in archives and digging through dusty files and things like that. Um, so a lot of this stuff, actually, I, I've had on hand for a number of years and I just never put it together. Um, so this was actually an opportunity to put it together and it's kind of been an honor of Bill. Um, I'm sorry that he passed that. We never accomplished that uh, history of Moulton Borough, but in any event. Um, we're going to go through the incorporation and, uh, and the, the, the chartering of uh, Moulton Borough. And to start with there has been no state that the land grants uh, have been more contested than the state of New Hampshire. There have been more court battles because of overlapping and so on. So the story is, good, is a lot more complicated than I'm going to give you tonight. This is, uh, you know, that Reader's Digest version. <laughs> It all started with uh, Captain John Mason and uh, Sir um, for I can I never say, I could never say his name George's. They were awarded by the King of England the land grants that basically covered Maine and New Hampshire. Um, then the two of them decided to split the grants in, in 1629, and uh, John Mason took basically what was New Hampshire. It's um. Oversimplifying, but basically speaking, uh, the, the line was like the Pescado River. Uh, Captain Mason invested 22,000 pounds, and at that time was a substantial amount of money, of clearing land in the Portsmouth area uh, to develop it, because Portsmouth was right away the, the harbors. Everything was about shipping. And the main reason why they wanted uh, the New England area because of the forest, they, were, they wanted the white pine for the mast for the British Navy, which was the same thing that was in upstate New York. They were all about the, the shipping for uh, the Royal Navy. In any event, he died at the age of 49 and never saw uh, America. He never made it. And then his lands went into dispute for the next 111 years. When his great grandson, uh, Colonel John Tufton Mason, um, had the rights, it went through a number of court battles back and forth. Again, complicated, muddy, murky, um, and he was just looking for a quick sell. And there was a, a faction of um, people in Massachusetts. Because in 1946 is when we got a royal governor back again, Benning Worthington. Prior to that, we were under Massachusetts. And some Massachusetts men, if they had the, the rights to the land, then they could have made it part of Massachusetts, and we wouldn't have had it in New Hampshire. So what happened is, is they, uh, 12 businessmen from Portsmouth, known as the uh, uh, Macyan proprietors, paid um, Colonel Mason. Uh, 1,500 pounds um, for the land. And these are the, what were known as the, the 12 uh, Macyan proprietors. 
um, the son of the governor was here, uh, George Jaffrey, he was the managing partner. Uh, he is actually the one who signed the grant approving the, the Moultonboro grant. Um, but these were businessmen of their day, mostly living in Portsmouth, and most of them um, in shipping, furs, or timber. Uh, the colonial governor, Benning Wentworth, he took over in 1741. And 46 is when they um, bought the land. But he, he had a <laughs> shady businesses going on when he was in England. And he, uh, he had sold a bunch of lumber to Spain, and Spain didn't pay him. And so he was trying to get his money from the British government. Um, and, uh, and the Wentworth family was very influential, very, very influential. So to basically pay him off, they gave him the appointment of the royal governorship for the um, New Hampshire and made it its own providence again. Um, and he took the position, and uh, he used it for his own benefit. He lined his pockets, uh, you know, taking care of his friends, family, and, and selling land grants. Um, which isn't covered in here, but he, he was selling land grants uh, in the area of Vermont, which he didn't have any written authority to do that, but he did it anyways. Um, and because New York was disputing Vermont, finally the, the council in, in England that ruled over the, the lands um, made the Connecticut River the border. And so therefore, that's, that ended New Hampshire right there. Vermont was still in dispute uh, of an area with New York um, until such time, but that's a whole other story. Um, but uh, he was quite the character. <laughs> and he ended up uh, leaving in 1766 because he, he, he was going to be basically fired. Um, but his cousin, which is the most known one, where John Wentworth took over as governor, um, basically the safe face for him. The reason why that, that, it, that Moulton Burl happened um, in uh, 1763 was the end of the French and Indian War. That's when all the, the uh, turmoil of the Indians up in this area um, had basically ended. But up to that time, there had been a lot of Indian raids from Canada and uh, the Mohawk area of New York. Um, the Indians, what Indians were here, and there really wasn't that many up here, they, they were mostly along the Merrimack Rivers and, and, uh, and the other riverways because Indians were basically farmers and fur trappers. Um, but with this, uh, the French and Indian War, basically all the, the Indian raids had ended. So therefore, the land was at peace, per se. And as in every other war, veterans come home, they tend to want to go out and, and on a venture. I mean, our, grow, our largest growing time in the history of the country was after World War II, which was when we had most veterans. And 1763 was considered one of the, and throughout time in history, one of the, the key years in history because that's when the Paris Peace Treaty was signed for uh, ending the French and Indian War, which was the first truly world war, which most Americans don't know anything about. Well, the Macy and proprietors, <laughs> this is the actual house that they would meet in on the second floor. This is known as the Studley Inn, owned by James Studley, uh, who operated it. It was at the time on Daniel Street, which was a short walk up from the uh, docks. Uh, in 1966, they were going to tear it down because they built a large uh, federal building and post office and so on in Portsmouth. So people got together, raised money, and they moved it to this location, which happens to be opposite the entrance to the uh, Strawberry Bank Museum that's in uh, Portsmouth, if any of you have visited it. It's a little colonial village of buildings that they've collected. Um, and so they met in this tavern, and James Stooley himself was a uh, ranger in uh, Major Roberts Rangers in, in the French and Indian War. Um, this was not his first inn. The first one burned down, and he built this one 
immediately afterwards and was built in 1761. Uh, he lived there with his uh, wife, uh, daughter, son, and he had two slaves. And I think the slaves were married because it was a, a male and a female. So this is where they met. This is where all the documents from Oldboro were signed in this building. On Wednesday, April 7th, 1762, at 5 p.m. in the afternoon, it's all written precisely and documented, um, they, they met, and there was a 50-mile square plot, which is what Moultonboro is. Um, they were going to, uh, it was first granted to Captain Ephraim Marston, and uh, he probably didn't take action or whatever, he just sat on it, so they decided to take it from him and instead give it to, at the time, Major Jonathan Moulton and Associates, and see how they spelled Wampasaki? And they didn't call it a lake, they called it a pond. Um, they were supposed to meet again on July 21st, 1762, but they didn't meet until again until November 17th, 1763, according to the records. Um, and and note that he's a major. Eventually he, he became a general, but all of his service, at least after the French and Indian War, was in the state militia. This is uh, Jonathan Moulton's house um, that's in Hampton, New Hampshire. Uh, by the way, the Stubley house and this, this I, I, I went down there and took the photographs myself. Um, I, don't know, I don't know how many years ago, but I, <laughs> I took them. And in any event, uh, he had served in the New Hampshire State Militia in the French and Indian War, in the Revolutionary War, and he was very good friends with Governor Benning Wentworth. Um, uh, he was a very flamboyant guy, but he was not well liked. He was not that popular. He was not a warm and fuzzy guy. Um, and, he, and he tended to get what he wanted. Uh, he died at the age of 62. 11 years after Moultonboro was incorporated. We do not know where he was buried, or his wife, or he actually had two wives. Um, he, married, he named his sixth child, which was a son, Benning, after the governor, George Benning. And Benning Moulton happens to be buried in Center Harbor. He's in the, he's in the cemetery when you drive by on 25. He's the, the monument that looks like a chess piece, looks like a rook. That's that's him and his family, okay. And that section of Center Harbor used to be part of Moultonboro, okay. Like I, uh, again, the boundaries changed and flexed uh, a little bit. But that's the only Benning that I know of that actually lived in the area and is buried here. I know Mary keeps an eye on him from the office. <laughs> so. They got their grant on the 17th, and these are the, there were 59 associates with Jonathan Moulton, and these were the conditions of the grant. They did not have to pay for the grant. The grants were, were free. It was a way of, of uh, getting the land developed. However, the proprietors got lots that, of the land divided so that they could sell them off later, and that's how they would make their money. And while their lots sat there until they did something to improve it, the, 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 the people of Moultonboro could not tax them. They were tax free. That's how they got paid for the land. The lots had to be proportioned equally in land size and quality of land. Meaning you can't give somebody a plot that they can't grow something on it. You have to be able to grow something on it. So if, if, if the quality is not good enough, then you have to give them more so the lands, it, 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 it all equals out. All the white pine trees, which was a, a royal law anyways, white pine trees fit for the majesty's use was reserved for the intent and purpose. So therefore they could not use them, they could not cut them down, uh, and so on. And usually um, they were marked or tagged, and, and they were closely tracked. Um, if any of the grantees fail to pay any and all charges of taxes and expenses, they forfeit their claim to the other grantees. In other words, if, if I didn't pay my share of what I was supposed to pay, it didn't go back to the proprietor, it didn't go to the grantors, it, it went to the other grantees, and they could divide it up. 
and you would do that until as long as everybody paid. It. And if the grantees fail to perform the, the, these grant conditions, the um, Macy and proprietors can wholly remove oust and expel grantees from the presence, premises. Their work. In other words, if, if they didn't meet the conditions of the grant, then the the grantors or the uh, Macy and proprietors could go in and have them removed. And like what happened to Marsden, someone else would get the grant to the land. The land laid out um, to allow uh, had, had be uh, allow for these uh, highways. In other words, they had to leave spaces for for roads and highways. Four roads uh, for highways, uh, two roads for the parcel. Um, you had to be able to get access to the lake. So when they landed by boat, um, they they had a way of getting off that was not privately owned. And uh, and they would lay as many roads as they could that would go to the to the to the pond. Within seven months, uh, which was in June, by June 1764, they had to lay out 82 shares. Each share had to have two separate lots, and 20 of the 82 shares were reserved for the Masonian proprietors and their heirs. It was handed down. Within nine months, they had uh, to uh, complete a land plot plan with the shares and lots laid out as required and clearly marked and numbered and submitted to the Masonian proprietors in Portsmouth. This was done, this is still on file. It, it, it has all the lot numbers on them and, and so on. Whether it was on time or not, I, I couldn't tell you. The records don't tell you. Within one year, at the expense of the grantees, they had to settle 20 families, they had to build suitable dwellings for the 20 families, and they had to clear and cultivate land for 15 more families. <laughs> in two years, they had to settle 15 more families, build suitable dwellings for the 15 families, and clear and cultivate another 15 more families. In other words, they wanted to make sure they were keeping perpetual motion to develop the land. And within three years, they had to settle 15 more families, build suitable dwellings, and clear and cultivate for 10 more families. And they had to build a meeting house for public worship for preaching the gospel. Within four years, they had to settle 10 more families, build suitable dwellings for those 10 families. So at the end of four years, there should be 60 families settled with suitable dwellings to live in. And they did take census to make sure that um, it was actually settled. Uh, census was a big thing going way back um, before this. And the census that's done today is actually in the Constitution. And it was done right after the, the very first one was done in 1790, after the Revolutionary War. Um, and then within six years, they had to be preaching the gospel and is duly supported and maintained constantly. And the town was required to pay the preacher, and actually receipts that were paid to him by the town are, are in the state archives, which is where most of this came from, the state archives in Concord. They paid him uh, $12 for a year. Now, the Revolutionary War happened in between all this while this developing was going on, and men did leave um, on and off for the war. They served both in the regular uh, army and in the militia. And the, the, the first, New Hampshire was the first. They went in the, and captured Fort William and Mary and, and took all the arms and the gunpowder and everything. And, and a lot of that that they took from there is what was used in Boston the Battle of Bunker Hill. That familiar? Okay. The first shots were actually fired in 1775, and then June 17, 1775, is was the Battle of uh, Bunker Hill, and uh, John Stark um, looked for or die. John Stark. Uh, he he was very notable in that battle and and was considered the uh, key in possibly saving. Um, Though we lost it technically, he saved as many Americans. Uh, uh, been, he he uh, kept it from being a worse disaster than it could have been. Um, 
And July 1775 is when George Washington arrives in Boston and officially took over the Continental Army, which had New Hampshire men. And then July 1777 is when uh, the British Army was driving down from Canada and uh, threatening this area, um, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire. And in 17, August 16th of 1777 is when we had the Battle of Bennington. And actually 12 men walked from Moldenboro to Bennington, Vermont to fight in that battle um, that were part of the militia. Uh, most of the battle was fought by militia and they were led by General John Stark. Uh, and there's one account of men that when, when they were done with all the prisoners, they, had, they were told, you're released. And they had to walk back on their own without pay. Um, and then we had the, the, the famous battle of uh, Saratoga um, and New Hampshire men were very <coughs> prominent in that battle in October of 77. And I give these not as a revolution, but to, to give you an idea of what was going on while we're trying to form the town at the same time. So in the fall of 1777, the inhabitants of Moltenboro in the county of Stafford petitioned the New Hampshire General Court to be incorporated. So the New Hampshire House of Representatives approved the bill November 24, 1777, and the New Hampshire Council approved the bill November 27, 1777, which made it official. Well, <clears throat> was that the general court of the previous British uh, no, no, supervision, no. or was this after 76 and therefore the locals had taken from seventeen control? From 1775, <laughs> they no longer answered to the British Crown. Okay, so they Which is part of what could could have been the delay. They were a little bit busy trying to fight the war than worrying about incorporating. Now the president of the historical society, I'm not sure, you know, asked me why Sandwich got incorporated in seventeen sixty three the same year they were granted. Well when I look back, I, I, I looked it up, not in a lot of detail, but clearly Sandwich was connected. Whoever was in Sandwich was very, very well connected. And they were organized before Moldboro, and they possibly might have been outside the Masonian grant, because I didn't see anything in the grant that Sandwich got it from them. So they were established, they had, they had officials and everything else, so they were basically ready to rock and roll when it came time, and that's, um, I believe why they got um, granted and incorporated. Now, what makes the difference between granted and incorporated? When you are incorporated, you can have local elections. You're given a seat at the House of Representatives, and uh, I don't know how the senators worked, or, or at least back then, but you at least got a, a seat on the House of Representatives and the State House. That's what incorporated meant. And that, that also gave the protection of state law of the select law and the, the tax collector and the moderator and, and, and so on. So that's what incorporation meant and, and it made it official and, and, and we were allowed to have local elections. But presumably the grantor could still um, claim, make claims if uh, he wasn't satisfied with the Well, by this time it's too late. It's too late, okay. Yeah. And the grantors are, uh, uh, the, uh, the Macyan proprietors could not, did not have the power to, to um, or authority to give the town of Moltenboro the authority to have local elections. That could only be given by the royal governor but, or they then. they still have rights at that time to? As long as they're meeting the contract. See, the difference between the, the America and England and the rest of them is that you could buy land. And, and land meant everything. That's why everybody came, is to buy land. They were all speculators. They weren't. The, the, the Puritans were minorities. I mean, they were all speculators trying to make money. Most of them in the beginning lost their shirts. Eventually, the money did come, but uh, most of it didn't come until after the Revolutionary War for, for uh, some of them, for businesses to, to develop. But um, they... Uh, um, as long as they met the contract, and if they were close enough, um, 
So were, were any um, actions taken uh, for not meeting the contract at any time? Nothing in the records. I, I'm, I'm going that the one Molten Borough probably, the, the, they started having, actually, they, they had selectmen and, and within themselves had elected selectmen and so on. They basically had a town government before they were incorporated. It, it just wasn't state recognized. And the first time that they met, um, where did I have that? They met in March of 1777. That's before they were incorporated, they actually had a town meeting. And uh, it was held by Ebenezer Malone, Jacob Brown, and David Folsom were signed in as a selectman. And they did all the motions that a that selectman and town government would, but they were not recognized by the state. Until they were corp incorporated, it, it really didn't matter to the state. It's, it's just the people in town. And being that we were so remote at the time, I, I, it, it really didn't matter. But what it did is, is we already had the structure. So what happened was Major Bradbury Richardson, some of you might have heard of him, he's kind of one of the most notable first guys. He's buried in Bean Cemetery. Um, he was empowered as the moderator. Now everybody thinks the moderator isn't really important, but the, the moderator oversees all the elections, even to this day. Right, Dick? I think he still does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he was directed to hold the first official town meeting, which they did in uh, January, after he gave a 14 days notice. And they had the meeting in January 1778, and they appointed temporary, you know, off, town officers. And then they held their first regular meeting. Uh, then they had their first official town meeting Tuesday, March 1778. Um, they were required. I, I don't know when it changed, but it was held for a long time, maybe even to our lifetime, that the town meeting was held on the last Tuesday of March. Now it's what, the first or the second? Second. Second. So at some point along the way, it changed. But it says in the, in the, in the, um, in the incorporation document, for life. Okay, so anyways, let's see. The, uh, when they had the elections, I got it in here somewhere, something else. I wrote an article I, that I forgot I wrote, I don't know how many years ago. Um, the uh, moderator was Major uh, Bradbury Richardson. He was elected as the moderator. Jonathan Moulton became the, uh, the town clerk. And I don't think it, it was the Colonel Jonathan Moulton. Uh, Captain Nathaniel Ambrose, Major Richardson, and Lieutenant James Brown became selectmen. Again, all officers, part of the militia, very involved with the Revolutionary War. And Adam Brown was elected the constable. And Annis Whipple and Nathan Lee were the town assessors. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. November 17, 1763 and the fall of 1977 when the town became incorporated. They built the town. So they, they, they was, should have started sooner than that? It took up 14 years? To... Well, like again, the, the, the reason why it was delayed, uh, I'm thinking it's because the Revolutionary War caused one delay, and the other is, is they just might not have been ready. They just, you know, it may not have exactly met, uh, other than having the map in Portsmouth, I still don't know if it was there on Pine, but they did do one because it's, it's still in the state archives. Um, and they were settling boundaries. Um, we, we, uh, one of the first land battles was uh, with um, Sandwich. Like I said, Sandwich was well connected. They, they uh, saw that they, the way the, the layout of the land they didn't have good roads going in there, so they just gave them more land so that they had the more suitable land to build roads. Yeah. At one time, I think Sandwich was being considered as state capital. Yeah. I 
think because of the central location within the state. Wouldn't be surprised. It, it was quite. When you read historical documents, you can get a sense something else was going on. Yeah. There was power in Sandwich. There were banks in Sandwich. There was a, there, there were heavy he, uh, heavy hitters in Sandwich. Uh, I don't know why, um, but there was. I, I have a, a guidebook, guide you know to go to the White Mountains, uh -huh. and I talked about the route that you would take, and, and uh, you could go by stage. This is in 1760s, and uh, talked about going through Moultonboro and described some of the wonderful things about Moultonboro, and then they said that that you, on your way to Tamworth, you, you merely pass through a corner of the town of Sandwich, and then in parentheses, a small rocky town of little interest. <laughs> <laughs> I always felt good about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like 16 is a, is a major artery. It doesn't seem like it now, but it, it was really the, ma the, the major highway north, and it was a route traveled by Belknap. Um, like the first uh, historian of New Hampshire, and he wrote the first history of New Hampshire, uh, and, and going into the Franconia Notch and the White Mountains and um, and uh, Mount Washington. Sir, in in some of the statutes, it said that they had to clear land for so many families, fifteen families or something. How much land? Per family, what, what, what was the size of the land? Well, it was, I, I didn't do the math, um, but basically speaking, they had to, uh, <coughs> yeah, right they had, it, it was roughly speaking 50 square miles, and somebody had the math that equated to 82 shares, divide that in half by two lots per share. So, 2 to 4, 16, 164 lakhs total in town. We're still fighting over it. The, the, one of the, well, there might even be a norm, but the last uh, land battle that, that I saw that reached the highest level in New Hampshire was in 1963. It was a guy trying to build a boathouse, and I'm not sure if it was State's Landing or Center Harbor Landing. He was trying to build a boathouse. You know, or replace one that had fallen down, and the selectman told him that uh, he he couldn't uh, build it the way he he because uh, he he ignored the the selectman and built it his own way, and um, the the town of Moultonboro sued him and whatever, and they uh, the town of Moultonboro won the uh, battle. I bet you know all about it. No, well, <laughs> particular case, but the rangeways were laid. And they had a half an acre at the lake. Yep. And the selectmen have always had to fight with the butters who would move, actually move town monuments <laughs> because they thought that the rangeway should go straight to the lake and not have that half acre at the lake. So they're forever infringing on town property. But it, that is one thing that cannot be taken. You could you could build a boathouse on it, you know, and nobody know it, and have it for 50 years, but you still can't own it because you cannot take that town property by adverse possession. Right. And uh, Ernest had something to say. Ernest Davis at a town meeting one time was talking about someone wanted to know why we keep surveying the rangeways, and Ernest said that uh, I think Mel Bourne was going to put it in his collection of Ernestisms. Uh, about how the, the, the monuments, the concrete monuments at the, at the rangeways, said the moon tends to draw them. <laughs> because they tend to move. You had uh, basically 59 grantees. Yes. From the now, all of them moved up here. No, but for the proprietors granted uh, to 59 well, 60 total. Uh, right, and they, they can see there's a few lots, extra lots in there for schools or whatever, uh, probably. They have a school, uh, parsonage, and a, 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 a town meeting place, which um, not only it was, was, was for town government, but um, primary for preaching. Right. And the third one was for schools. 
Right. Uh, and, then okay, at so the then, end, and then at the end, <clears throat> for like he's talking, it still exists today, having access to the lake. So this, this group of grantees then had to organize how they were going to attract 20 families that first year to actually live on the land and clear it and get ready for the next 15. Well, Jonathan Moulton actually built a house here. Well, I mean, that would have obviously, he didn't look been, it. I mean, something that would have obviously been an option. He, he never, uh, he, he probably spent some time here, but he didn't, obviously, he had a nice enough a house. Um, he, uh, um, but he, you know, but they either had playing to, games is not new no. to the human being. So I, I was just, is there any information about who built what when in order to meet these? Well, there are uh, names written on the lots and whatever. Um, the, the problem with, with the census back then, particularly like the 1790, the first official sentence, uh, sentence they, they have, you know, ownership and they'll list their names and so on and they'll say they have children and it'll say male between the age of 1 and 10 and in 10 and 20 and so you can have an idea the the first man that, that died um, some of you may or may not know I did the research in it for the for the uh, fallen heroes monument that's out at the town hall up here at the town hall it has all the names from all the all the men that died in Moultonburg and the very first one died at um, Valley Forge um, and he was a Blake now, I don't know how old he was. There's no way to find out. There's no record. Um, I believe he had a father here. Uh, there, uh, obviously, there's a Blake family. There, there's Blake Road. You, you have all of the 59 original grantee names. Yes, they're all written out. Yes? Who built the roads? I mean, the, the, the grantees obviously had wealth, but the people who were coming to live on the land probably didn't have a lot of money. Land doesn't get developed until you build the road to get to Well, it, remember, this is really before you had currency. So currency was labor. So, and, and it was in, in there. It, right, the other thing is, is most of who are up here, and you talk about Moultonboro, if you go back 70 years ago, all these trees that are around here were not here. Right. You, could you could go out the door and see the lake. Mm -hmm. Trees on, on land made land worthless. They took them all down. So having roads was not a problem. And he had to go from, you know, it, it, it was just part of it. Um, it, it. It's later on, you know, where um, improving the roads, you know, whether you, you know, put gravel down and then paving and whatever. Our roads here weren't even paved till the late 1920s or the early 30s. Um, up to that point, they were dirt and they were oiled a couple times a year. It was a very messy process, but they took a basically an oil truck. And they had uh, a rod in the back of it, and they ran oil, went down all the roads, putting oil on it to keep the dust down. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, there are some roads that they still do it. <laughs> but um, um, it, it was, it, you know, for, for commerce, for families, and for everything, roads, roads were the benefit of everybody. So I, I believe they, they built the roads themselves in each town. And they, they just came to the agreement of um, taking and, and connecting them. Because, uh, again, it worked mutually for everybody. I mean, highways was not, I don't know if anybody knows the history of our highways, but um, General Eisenhower in the 1930s took an army group and went across the country by road with an army convoy to see how, how it would take. And it, it took him something like three months. We, we just did not have the roads to go across the country. And when we beat the Germans, uh, Eisenhower was amazed by the Autobots, the, the, the highway system that Hitler had built in Germany, known as the Autobots. And that's why when he became president, we started building the highways that you see today. It's all from Eisenhower's. All from what he saw in Germany from the Autobots. And then did it really start getting into being paid by the state, paid by the federal government, and, and so on. But all the, the, the uh, and the justification for spending federal money on the highways rather than states was for uh, 
uh, defense purposes. So it's defense, you know, it, they can turn around and clear a highway. It's still in law. It, I don't know if it's ever ever been used. It, it, in the early 60s, they used to have drills, but the highways were cleared, and only the military could move on the highways. Back in the days when we hid under our desks at school, those days. Um, so roads, it, 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 we, we were slow in this country to evolve that. Actually, we, we went to trains and boats, you know, first boats and then to trains, um, as opposed to roads. Well, if you read it all by hand, you're wondering how guys who never came up here could write what the lot was. There was no marks, monuments, or anything, you know. There, it wasn't surveyed precisely. Um, just the way they wrote it out, which is why there were so many court battles in the end. Um, we got the neck, um, which was part of it was part of Meredith, and then they gave it all to us, which is why Black Cat Island, some of you may or may not know, part of it's Moltborough, part of it's Meredith. Mm -hmm. That they did not, and neither, neither town was willing to relinquish it. Um, we didn't get Long Island until 1799. So um, it, it, it went on for, like I said, until 1963. It was the last time I saw a, you know, a, a court battle over the borders. And like Stick saying, that you, you always have people trying to, particularly on the water, you know, trying to take what they can get. Yes, ma'am. Now, that 82 shares, and you had mentioned earlier that Center Harbor was part of Malton Borough. Now, so uh, Center Harbor was up as 82 shares, or was that after the fact? And what is the story, the separation of the two? I, I don't know, because I would have to look at the history of Center Harbor. Okay. And, and Center Harbor actually still relied on Malton Borough. I, uh, um, I remember Roger saying that Center Harbor didn't even, you know, have a cemetery to bury their people in. Uh, um, until yeah. in the last 30 years, maybe 20 years, uh, because that cemetery they haven't had a, a recent burial. That cemetery that we talked about, they haven't had a recent burial in there in probably 100 years. So I, I really don't know. I did look into, you know, it, it, it can grow on you if you keep going into the different towns. But it was called the Moultonboro Extension, and then they it it, it became. Center Harbor. And the reason why it was called Center Harbor is because you had Meredith Harbor and Moltborough Harbor. It was in the center of the two. Real fancy name. <laughs> the Central School. Still the Central School. You know why it's the Central School? Because it was center of town. It was central. When we had at one time something like 14 schools in this town. It just, and we haven't renamed it since. Been there since 1949, 48. <laughs> Anything else? Just a nice thank you. Thank you. Thank you.